Episode fifty nine of Quarantine. Uh, we we are we are almost at the first year of Quarantine, and here we are almost at our sixtieth show. We're excited because soon this show itself will be eligible for the COVID vaccine because uh, we'll be hitting sixty five. Uh, today's show it really is continuing in this series we've been doing on uh, on the world that we get to build and on kind of the possibilities in this endless frontier. Today, we're going to focus on how the built environment, and particularly the built environment in healthcare, can so drive health outcomes. Um, I mean, if you think about it, if you have a space, you can measure what works and what doesn't work. And that's another form of data and another form of, a form of input into health. And um, our co-host, Mickey McManus, has been deeply looking into this on the board of an entity in that space. And today we're going we're gonna to dig in. And this is not just about how space affects us in institutions, but in general, the effect it has on us. Something that this year, since we've all been indoors and upfront on both mental health issues and building and space issues, we're going to get into. And I'm excited because this is another one of those fascinating solutions when you add space to data, to amazing thinking. Mickey, welcome. Hey, Peter. Yeah, I'm, this is a really important topic to me, I think. You know, I feel, I feel deeply about this. And um, I, I don't think everyone really quite understands how much the space shapes what they can do every day, what, what we believe we can do, what our, what our aspirations are. <clears throat> so I'm super excited to have this topic at the forefront, particularly around health. And, um, you know, think of uh, the last time you went to a hospital, uh, it might have been when you were born. It might have been during the crisis. It, it, you know, it might have been when you were having a, a baby. Uh, and so um, how are they designed? How are they designed so that they actually are based on evidence so that we get better over time at these places that, that, are, that are there to care for us and help us strive and help us live? Uh, and, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. We've got two uh, guests here live, and then we've got an in-the-field report that we're going to have with some of the advisors from a group called the Center for Health Design. And uh, the two people we've got today, actually, let's bring them both up, Deb and Samia. Um, uh, hey, Deb. Hey, Samia. Good and to be, here. Uh, be sure to turn off your microphone if, 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 uh, if I put you on the spot. Um, so, Deb, you are the president and CEO of the center. Um, this is super exciting. And then Samia, you're a master's student or, or graduate who won the award this year for evidence-based design in healthcare facilities. So I'm very excited. We'll probably have Samia come on back. Samia, where are you at right now before we, before we jump in and, and I interview Deb a little bit? Yeah, I'm an architectural designer at Cunningham in San Diego. Oh, excellent. And just before before we we jump into what's going on with that, how did you even find out about like designing as an architectural designer? You know, designing with evidence based design and things like that. Where did you first learn about that? Through my university, we have a professor there who's very involved in the Center for Health Design and very involved in using evidence to create design. So I joined a program my fourth year of my five year master's program, and it kind of just took off from there. Perfect. Exciting. What's your what's your feeling about it? I mean, what have you what, what do you feel like it's it's given you in terms of a professional? I love it. I think throughout my designs for my whole um, school, I was always looking at evidence um, just in terms of demographic evidence and always wanted me wanting to make informed design decisions. And then once I found out about the fact that there's this whole network out there with existing literature and really um, focusing on using, you know, evidence to create informed decisions with design. I'm 
yeah, it's just been an exciting thing to learn an exciting thing to get better at and use um, in my final project of the. Samia, one of the no, things we'd love to I'll do go ahead, Peter. Is, connect, is connect the dots between shows. And it's interesting, last week we had on uh, several architects and we were looking at how one could program and activate communities, program pop-up spaces, retail spaces, use those for economic development so that the, the, the neighborhood could learn and inclusively grow. And so we looked at and, and and if you get to make it programmable, then you can have feedback and start affecting things. It's interesting. We were looking at an objective function of economic development last week. Today, we're looking at space and the function of health outcomes. But it, it's amazing. They're built from similar cloth and made possible because we can do things quicker and sense them and react now. Yeah. And they're very much intertwined. Um, the built environment has a huge effect on everything. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting. So yeah, by the way, last week, um, Peter went uh, on the road to San Diego and uh, took and, ha and, and brought us kind of a man on the street interview with a number of people doing something called Code Place, where they set up sort of shipping containers. They give people in the blighted neighborhoods of San Diego a chance to like start in just a half a shipping container, like a coffee shop or laundromat. And they build um, Main Street entrepreneurs, and they get to try again and again, and then and then as they're doing that, it's bringing money into that neighborhood, it's bringing people in, and it was this notion of instead of gentrifying and then kicking people out who are there, embrace the culture, embrace what's happening there, um, and so yeah, there's a there's probably a thread that goes through our show because we really believe the built environment matters, and and these are not independent, they're kind of all intertwined. So Sammy, we'll ask you to come on back a little later. Uh, so thank you so much for joining, though. We really appreciate uh, taking some time on a Friday night with us. Uh, okay, Deb. Um, evidence-based design. That seems like we should just have always done that. Have we Have we not always done evidence-based design? Tell me a little bit about the journey of saying, you know, let's let's bring more rigor or more science or or that because because you've been there since the inception. Yeah, so give us a yeah. little sense of the yeah, so like the journey. Yeah. So for me, it'll be 32 years in the fall. So clearly, we've been talking about evidence-based design for a long time. And I think, you know, if you go back into the books and the literature, uh, the use of research to make design decisions isn't new. It just wasn't standard. And so, you know, the center, when it started, had just such a deep belief that we could make better design decisions if we use the current research and what we know in order to inform those design decisions. But more than that, we created this eight step process that led to creating more research, right? Because it's great to have the body of research we have, but if we don't continue to grow that body of research and learn new things and continue to push the envelope, then you know any industry would be stagnant. So the center really was about making that connection between the built physical environment and outcomes and safety and healthcare, um, but doing it by building that evidence base and then making that evidence base as readily available to people as we possibly could. So it seems to me that um, I first met you, I think, at a, at a big um, uh, health design conference. Yeah. And, um, and it was really exciting to see so many people. You had architects, you had, you had city planners, you had urban planners, you had doctors, you, you know, you had a whole mixture. Tell us a little bit about the membership and about you know, pulling together the conferences and, and getting that kind of stuff happening at the early days of this. Yeah, it's one of the things I love about the Center for Health Design is that um, it really is the big tent, right? So we're not architects and designers talking to architects and designers. Early on, we realized that change was only going to happen if we could bring together the product manufacturers, the architects, the designers, the landscape architectures, the program planners, the health. So when you say product designers, for example, you've got like uh, Philips with MRI machines. You've got Steelcase with the beds in the in in the in the uh, hospital. Anything you know, that can fit. Every it, single part of the environment. Yeah. Right. It's all part of the puzzle that can make the best possible healthcare environments. And so that was what really uh, separated out the center from any other organization at the time was, you know, everybody could be a part of it. And though we do have a membership base, we're not a membership organization. People have chosen to become members and to become aligned with the center because they love the mission. But really, anybody can have access to our information. You can see our 
website is here running across the bottom. Anybody can come. We have a ton of tools and resources that are available to people to not just teach them about the evidence-based design process, but also to bring that information to light, right? Make it easy to use it, make it easy to find it, make it easy to connect with other people. I mean, that's well, it, me what I love about the center, right? Is that community that we've built. You said bring it to light. I think one of the things as an architect or a designer that you struggle with, I know I, you know, as a product designer would struggle with it, is you might have had a really good idea for approaching things, um, but having something to back it up, say, actually, we're doing this based on a piece of research. This is going to actually lower you know, readmission rates in the hospital. This is going to lower MRSA infections in the hospital so that, you know, so so that we aren't battling a second thing just because somebody came in the hospital. It feels like that's one of the more uh, valuable things. At, if I were a product designer or an architect, I want to go, what's the best practice? And the best practice is not a static thing, as you said. The best right. practice is always moving to the last practice while the next practice is being invented. And you kind of created this living organism. What was most successful in, oh yeah, it looks like Peter's got a good question here, go. Oh, you're on mute, Peter. That is the, that is the secret. I think I was gonna ask the question you were about to go to, which is to get a sense of specifics here, um, like what had the biggest impact or was most successful? Also of the kind of things you've tested, what surprised you the most? Like we had no idea about that. Um, and yeah, you know, that's basically it. Kind of get just some examples of things that show us it might not have been intuitive, but it made a difference. Yeah. So I, I think that what's been the most successful, honestly, is creating the field. That that the Center for Health Design was able to bring together people through early on our conferences and then many other programs and products since then that created a community, right? It created like-minded people to help them realize. <laughs> that they weren't the only one who innately felt this, right? That in general, I think a lot of designers and architects, and I know mm -hmm. this is true for me, um, just innately have a sense and a feeling and a hypersensitivity to our environments that we just know things to be true. What the center was able to successfully do was bring all of those people together, right? Create this community of like-minded people so that you had others who you realized were in the game with you. And then, um, provide them with the tools and resources, not just to do what they already knew how to do or do it better, but to go to the clients and be able to say, look, here's the research that backs us up, right? That was the brick through the window to say, I'm not telling you just to do this or to spend this additional dollars because it's what I think you should do. There's research that shows you that it's going to save you money along the way, right? It's it's not just about spending a little bit more right now. It's about year after year, you are going to save money on your operations and on medical errors, on in a million other different things that are gonna make a big difference in the long run. So talk a little bit about the Pebbles Project, because I think the specifics, uh, you know, that's one example that you did early on. And it became kind of a way that that uh, was almost like the, the hospitals were talking to each other through your through your community, through your movement. So can you give us an example of that? Because I think that's just, yeah. it helps putting something very tangible. And Peter, this goes back to your question. I mean, the Pebble Project was one of our more successful, successful initiatives and it was the right thing at the right time, right? And it was when people were just starting to want to use an evidence-based design process in building their hospitals. And so hospitals were coming to us and we created this community of, of Pebble partners, people who got together three times a year to learn everything that they could possibly learn and then use it with their design professionals or their manufacturers of products to um, make the decisions on their on their built environment. So, you know, it was a little bit of an incubator, it was a little bit of an accelerator. It ran from about 2000, probably the last Pebble just um, finished their research not that long ago. And the goal was not just to bring them together to learn from one another, right? Like I remember clearly this one story of a hospital saying that they decided on a January 1 open date for their brand new hospital. And they thought that was brilliant. Like let's start the new year with a new hospital. But what they didn't make the connection on something so simple as that everybody was gonna have to do a lot of heavy lifting during the holidays and the last month of the year. And so every pebble after that was able to learn from that as well as any research that was done that they could build into the designs and their processes. You know, the one negative about 
about the Pebble project, the, the area that we just, we constantly were fighting on, which is that a team of people come in and they are gung-ho and they believe in, in using an evidence-based process and they, they create this project, they execute the project, and then a new team comes in to really run the hospital. And at that point, mm. They're in the business of is running a hospital. And unfortunately, a lot of the research just didn't end up happening, right? The intention was, but it, once the hospital opened its doors, it was so busy just in the business of healthcare that some of that follow up research didn't happen. And that was always disappointing because our goal was to build to this body of knowledge. But for sure, I know that these facilities were were better facilities for the millions of people who would use them because they were in the Pebble project, even if they didn't get to, to do the research. What's an example though, like flip it on the, on the other side, because you know, I've, I've seen and you know, sitting in the board of advisors and listening to uh, tangible things like, oh, we did this thing and this is what we discovered. And now like we do it now, this is, this, this is the, the approach you know, from the whole effort. Cause I think you turned it into like, there were awards for best Pebbles and things like that. What's an example of one of those that you just were like, wow, that's so good? Well, and not necessarily always from the Pebble project, but some of the research that mm -hmm. has made a big difference is, you know, the simple understanding of maneuvering people and, you know, patients and caregivers through bathroom doors, right? And in the old days, there was a door, it swung out and people had to, you know, maneuver their way through. And there were a lot of injuries that were happening both to the caregivers as well as mm -hmm. to the patients in that process. And, you know, something as simple as widening a bathroom door and creating a barn door that slid back and forth versus a door that opened into the room dramatically was able to kind of create a space that didn't create as many injuries, right? Single patient rooms, realizing that um, not only were multiple patient rooms not ideal from a healing standpoint, they're not ideal from an infection control standpoint or a medication mm -hmm. error. I mean, could you imagine you check into a hotel and they say, Miss Levin, your roommate's already up in the room. I, I hope you and Mrs. Jones get along. You would never stay in that hotel, right? Yet a hospital where you are definitely at your worst and potentially yeah. contagious, family members are visiting. You know, you were there with somebody else who was a complete stranger who had their own set of infection you might issues. might have a whole, yeah, that you didn't want to get. That's right. Yeah, actually, Omid, can you pull up the Center for Health Design's uh, website? Because I think this will be really important for people to see. It helps put it, make it very visual and visceral. Um, are you out there in the, in the ether, Omid? Yeah, and you'll see when we get to the actual website, there are a lot of amazing tools right up front that are free for people. So the interactive well, design. Like, uh, yeah, click on the interactive design diagram. Yeah. That was the one I was going to say. Um, if you click on that, you actually get to see, oh, okay, for an inpatient room, there are all these little dots that are like moments that you can actually do slightly differently. So if you're about to design a maternity ward, if you scroll down a little bit, it's maternity ward, or here, medical surgery thing, these are things that matter. Uh, yeah, click on any one of the pictures. And then when you click on the dot, you can actually see the details. Like, this is what you should do here. Think about this. And this kind of came out of this community and started to turn into best practices. Because when and you're a designer or an architect, you're like, what should I do? You know, and you, you maybe go look at pictures or you like try to read the literature, but it's really nice to have this depth. Like and HVAC what, matters, you know. About, yeah. Nick, you see there's not just the design strategies, but each of those blue pieces afterwards is the research that backs up the design strategy. So uh, it's you know, okay. that easy to use diagram. It's this full circle of everything you could possibly want to know. And it's great, as I say, to inform decisions, but it's also great to share with clients to help them understand why these are things you need to think about. Does this stuff, once it's shown like this with these great examples, just take off within the community or does it require selling or slow adoption? What happens when you put the research and the efficacy together? It's a good question. You know, I, I think that it's a combination of both. I think there are some things that just take off and become standard. And there's some things that still to this day, um, you wonder why we're doing the way we're doing when we know better. You know, a lot of it, you, you, designers and architects are as good as their client allows them to be. Right. Some of the most amazing projects I've seen have been because of really forward thinking CEOs who say, you know, I remember one of our Pebble Project CEO was like, run until apprehended. And she had t-shirts made for her team to say, mm -hmm. run until apprehended. Like you just take this as far as you can. And I'll tell you when it's too far. 
So, you know, you need clients who who are educated and that's part of our EDAC program. We have this certification called EDAC and the whole goal around EDAC is to help people. It's not didactic learning of how many square feet should a patient room be. It's it's about that process and to help people. And so that sort of certification and training and outreach. Actually, Omid, let's pull that back up. It's under the certification tab. Um, but here's an example, you know, become EDAC certified. And it turns out if you're in any of these spaces, have, getting certification helps you. You know, if you're a nurse practitioner, getting certified helps you level up in terms of your pay grade. If you're, you know, in these different situations. And so, you know, there's also you've got things like the built environment network, which, which kind of is a sub network that weaves together people who are actually running these things and building them. You know, Kaiser Permanente is part of the network. And and the Veterans Administration and things like that. And so um, it, it, it gets people to say, you know, first, let's get you certified. So you know the basics, you know the, you know the core, and it's rigorous. Um, so I just, yeah, I think that helps. I'm always looking for tangible examples because it's hard to say, you know, people, you say, oh, this is center. But, but this is what's actually put out to work yeah. over, over time. People are EDAC certified all around the world. We had somebody the other day ask about the Middle East and we looked and there, there are dozens of people in the Middle East who found their way to EDAC and have become certified. And you know what's great about EDAC is it just helps everybody have a common conversation, right? If you have common mm -hmm. language, common understanding, you just can get so much further because you're never gonna build the right kind of healthcare facility in a singular conversation. It takes so many different disciplines to, to be a part of that conversation to make sure you get to the best place. And you know the thing I should say is that the center is not just about hospitals. We're hospitals and psych facilities and long-term care facilities and healthcare mm -hmm. and home. And you know anywhere that health happens, the Center for Health Design is trying to have an input in impact on how to do that best. You know, healthcare- Well, you had, um, uh, I remember just so vividly when, uh, when Susan Denser shared at, at um, at the center's advisory board about telemedicine, you know, and she had been a PBS journalist talking about health for a long time. Um, because of your connection, you know, I asked Susan to come on our show and she told us right in the heart of the pandemic, this is what's happening. Like there's a mismatch between paying for telehealth and doing telehealth. And because of the pandemic, it's getting flipped around and people are realizing you could have had a lot more of these, these hospital visits from your home using Zoom. And you can't uh, and just- so it's kind evolving. Of yeah. You know, in order to have the best telehealth environment, you need to think about things like camera angle and lighting. And, you know, because a lot of diagnostics is about physically looking at the patient, right? And so you need to make sure you have the best possible environment. You know, somebody's sitting in a yellow room with the wrong lighting, you could think that something's wrong with them that isn't, right? So design is even a part of telehealth. You just reminded me of something. I remember that Steelcase and Philips were working together on kind of a deployable thing that would then be a physical space that like a veteran could go visit, but it wasn't just a video thing because it turns out in rural areas, this is tough. Maybe everyone doesn't have broadband, but it also had telemedicine, like it had blood pressure cuff. It had other kinds of things. And it was like certified. We knew we could trust it because the doctor wants to trust it. So exactly. that's a, another beautiful example. I, I noticed Roz Kama has joined us. Hey, Roz. Um, and uh, she's part of the center. And then someone else in the, in the uh, comments uh, said, uh, Christina Sands said that this makes me think of post qualitative research and actor network theory. And I think that I don't know what, what those two things are, but um, I can maybe imagine. I mean, post qualitative research, like how do we go back and actually find out if what we thought is what really happened? Um, so, so definitely a lot of people in the, in the, in the chat are jumping in in the comments tab. Um, just to sort of to say hi and also to, to say, you know, what about this? What about that? Um, I'd love to jump. Do you want to set up uh, the winter bash a little bit? The, the, the conversation we had with, uh, with Vikram and Roger and team? Sure. Yeah. The winter bash came out of the fact that COVID stopped us from having our big national conference where thousands of people come to healthcare design every year. And we missed it, right? We missed each other that, like I said, one of the great things about healthcare design is it's an amazing community of people. And so we decided to still have a online party. And um, it was a combination of musical entertainment and intellectual entertainment, and then just 
breaking into small groups and hanging out with each other. And um, we we asked you guys to pull together a mini quarantine in order to allow us to have some intellectually stimulating conversation like you would at a at a dinner party, but you know, do it in, in the way we're all living our lives right now, which is through these mm. screens. And that's what this is. So it's a, a group of people who were all friends of the center, um, many of whom are on our advisory board like you, Mick. And um, you know, you facilitated a great conversation that was just about the what ifs, right? You know, those kind of cool conversations that you can have when you're having a drink and sitting together over a meal. Yeah, so the conversation was grand challenges. And um, and we had uh, Vikram Dendi, who, um, who leads an initiative inside of Microsoft that's all about health. Like, how, that's a big platform. What are they doing? And he's on the bleeding edge, the R&D edge. And he brings a beautiful system view to things. And then we also have Roger Landry, who um, one of his patients when he was this, you know, surgeon general and a surgeon and a doctor in the Air Force was Chuck Yeager. Just yesterday we had, you know, the perseverance landing on Mars and Chuck Yeager was from the right stuff. The person who kind of first broke the broke broke through the surface of, of, of the atmosphere. Um, so but Roger uh, wrote a book called Live Long, Die Short. And he's going to talk a little bit about this, like what happens after 65? You know, how do we how do we have a long life and then die instead of this slow decline where we lose our loved ones and friends, we lose our mobility, we lose all those things. Uh, and he's doing some wonderful stuff. And then Amy Shao from Mass uh, Mass Design Group uh, is a nonprofit, amazing. I know Autodesk Foundation has contributed to them and many others. Amazing group that's looking at architects working in um, vastly different places in the world, uh, thinking about new ways of designing so that they really sit, situate in place. And then we got Thomas Getz. And uh, a few uh, episodes ago, we had his partner in crime, Steve Downs, from Building H. Uh, and Thomas will talk, and he was a journalist at Wired for 10 years. He's written some books. So let's actually go to a conversation with them about grand challenges from their point of view. We're so excited to have this special edition of Quarantine here. We're still excited to be able to come together and, and be a part of this. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, I think what I'm going to do is I just want you to give us a who are you? Roger, who are you? What's, well, what's going on with you? I am Roger Landry. I'm a preventive medicine physician. I wrote a book called Live Long, Die Short. I'm president of Masterpiece Living, and we partner with communities, senior living communities, in order to uh, inspire and cultivate resilience, purposeful longevity, and just uh, overall health and quality of life. Amy, I don't know you at all. Who are you, Amy? Yeah, I'm, I'm a designer and researcher with Mass Design Group. We're a nonprofit design collective based um, primarily in, in the U.S. and Rwanda. We've worked on health facilities amongst other types of architecture around the world. I'm curious, what are you particularly focused on right now? Um, one of the topic areas that I'm really personally passionate about is maternal health. And that kind of coincided. I began working with Ariadne Labs, Neil Shah at Ariadne Labs mm -hmm. on a bunch of research a few years ago, connecting the layout of U.S. maternal health units with C-section rates. At that same time, I was working on the evaluation of a, a maternity waiting home that we completed in Malawi, comparing that against a standard government waiting homes to try to look at the improvements and differences between the two designs. And I also had twins at the same time. So my experience oh going my through the, <laughs> being hospitalized for, for a complication and then going through NICU, I think all cemented that. And so that's one of my areas that I, I really feel passionate about and, and have been focusing on and have been working on some projects while I'm here based in Rwanda. Vikram, who are you? I'm still figuring that out, Mickey. I think <laughs> Life has been full of really amazing experiences. I, I am at Microsoft now. I've been there for about 15 years. The area that has been very fascinating and really consuming a lot of my and my team's focus has been around healthcare and even more recently around access to healthcare as well. I want to hear, who are you, Thomas? I'm glad to be here. So my name is Thomas Getz. I'm a journalist and an entrepreneur and a public health champion. I have spent my career in various capacities, but basically the theme has been using data design and words 
to help people make better healthcare decisions and better understanding of their path. I, in particular, my, my day job at present is I'm chief of research at GoodRx and my Skunkworks project, which is the reason I'm here, it's a project we call Building H, which is actually a, a, a nod or a wink to, to campuses like at Microsoft. Building H stands for health, which is probably obvious to this crowd. It's really the realization that our day-to-day -day lives are very good at making us comfortable, but not effective at all at making us healthy. What we're trying to do is inspire a new generation of, of creators, designers, entrepreneurs, technologists to take responsibility for their products and services and build health as an outcome of their environments, of their products. What do you care about deeply that you think of as a grand challenge? Health is not the responsibility of our healthcare industry. It's the responsibility of all the other products and services, the environments, the, our houses, our homes, our communities. That's where health happens. Everyone is, we've been talking about the gray tsunami. We've been talking about the demographic for a long time, but I don't think that we really have responded in a way that is going to be needed. This demographic that's coming is not only an age thing. One of the things you've been pushing quite a lot on is this notion that when you're over 65, you actually get quite a lot of energy and passion and learning and everything by interacting with people that are in their 20s or other generations. How is that showing up in the built world? We designed senior living and it's been our job to try to take that environment where we sequester and uh, blow up all the walls so that there is intergenerational contact. You know, that's just one kind of gap that has become, you know, very apparent. And as you look around the world between kind of the haves and the have nots and the low and middle income countries and developed nations, everywhere. These gaps are only increasing and it, it, it's hmm. shined a spotlight on, on what those gaps are and how difficult it is. So what Thomas said resonates with me, yeah. like hmm. designing for the resilience of the society, designing for the, the wellness of everybody is something that needs to be like a core principle of hmm. everything that we build. And it's going to be really difficult to shift this mindset and moderate it and modulate it to also bring in some of these long-term difficulties that come if you don't think more holistically. I think we also have to remember that ultimately healthcare is not a transaction, but an exchange. And we can't start by trying to optimize behavior and reduce risk and design for worst case scenarios that we also have to design for for people, for a connection, for the human moments that happen in these places and, and how design can be restorative. Healthcare is more about just than designing hospitals. It's about stepping back, thinking about the big picture. There's a lot of talk about how we want to be designing for the social determinants of health, whether that be food or housing or all of those things. Stepping back even more, I think we need to be paying more attention to notions of one health. What does it mean to consider human health and ecological health and animal health in a way that's very intertwined and that influences our food systems and our nutrition and our agricultural um, systems? On a very general sense, I, I, I don't have specifics, but I'd love to spend some time with Vikram and talk about this demographic and how do we close that gap and, and how do we, we make more adopters of older adults? I see all of these as related. I, I don't think it is a singular challenge. I think these are all connected. Today's young people become tomorrow's older people. And they are confident, they've grown up with this stuff, etc. But it also comes with like a lack of attention, lack of patience, and they manifest as handicaps later on when they become old people. As we are thinking about what mm -hmm. Thomas was saying, using words and design and, and all, all the things that are uh, at your disposal. When you look at like computer scientists and technologists thinking about what they can do, there was this big period of time where there, there was a lot of like conversational agents as being the silver bullet. Bots will basically help and solve all of these problems. The reality is that it is actually a really powerful capability because it's more, it can be more natural and, and, and so on. 
but without it being backed by a sense of understanding of the person mm. without having some core principles and guidelines around how humans and AI can interact, you will actually make things worse. I, I feel like I have more to learn from each of those people, each of the other people on this call. As Roger was saying earlier, we put so much emphasis on when it comes to preventive health is, a, is the responsibility of the individual. And that is so wrong, I, I believe, because we've created a system in which individual behavior, everything is leading us to make bad choices. And we expect individuals to somehow use an app that will have them transcend their everyday environment. And so when I was hearing what Amy was talking about, I feel like what she's doing is building environments that manifest health. Mm -hmm. And I would love to understand how better understand what's happening in healthcare environments to manifest health and to bring that into other contexts so that, so that car manufacturers realize, oh, I'm, if I having, if I'm incentivizing people to sit in a car for three hours a day, that's going to lead to outcomes. And I'm responsible yeah. for those outcomes and I need to program against mm. them and not just say, mm. oh, and after you get out of the car, go for a jog. Roger, I think I would love to understand what you're doing more. And I, I feel like one of the learnings that we had was that, you know, spaces that are better for people, period, are also better for pandemics, like the models of, of spaces where there are smaller knit clusters of community and people not just having rooms along one giant hallway, but clustered in a greenhouse model or clustered more intimately in ways that they can have pods or relate to one another and it not be in an institutional setting. And I'd love to learn more from you about the work that you're doing and if there are any opportunities for space to help there as well. I'd love that. I just want to say thank you to everybody who was able to share a little bit of this and you don't have to be strangers. You're connected and you're part of this event that Deb is hosting. Keep playing together. It would be really yeah. good. Thank I'm you for so being excited. a great host there, Mickey, as always. <laughs> Nick, you're on mute. Boy, this really does point out how completely interdisciplinary all of this is. And it must be difficult to try to keep healthcare design in the healthcare category when the whole point of all of that is everything you've learned could apply everywhere. I think that's the exciting part, Peter, right? Is that every environment we've come to realize is a healthcare environment. And with yeah. COVID and the amount of times we're spending in our home, yeah. your home has become your latest healthcare environment, right? Being able to, you know, get outside, live in a place where you can have access to nature and, you know, quality air and, and peace and quiet when you need it for work. All of these things have come to realize are something we need to design into our homes. You know, somebody told me that, you know, we've been building these big homes that uh, that are like these great rooms. That's been the design for so long. And what we've come to realize is now that people are all living at home together and school and work and all that's happening, there's no space to get away from one another and to do your yeah. own thing, right? So what we thought was a great design has turned out through COVID to not be such a great design. And I think that's been one of the, the most important things that we've learned through COVID is how everywhere we go is about health and wellness, how many people it takes, how many disciplines it takes to do that right and to do that well, and how health health really is everywhere from our communities to our homes, to our behavioral health facilities, to our, our hospitals. You know, I think what's, what's interesting is, uh, Peter, you just said something, uh, you know, that teases out a little bit what Vikram said as well, which is all these things are interconnected. They're not yeah. silos. It's not... Yeah just aging over here and birth over there. Actually, that's all of us. We all have that. We don't, you know, we need to think about this differently. Um, one of our guests from a while ago has been working via uh, Deb through the Built Environment Network um, with a guy named Cliff in uh, Canada. And Cliff has run buildings, built buildings, designed buildings for health. And, uh, and Azam came on our show, uh, on our Cool Tools show last year and talked about how we might use machine learning to help us kind of dynamically see the system view of these things. And he said, you know, they, he showed us, um, I think it was something on the order of a 60 foot long paper or whiteboard diagram of all the code that the building had to do, all the requirements that had to happen, all the people who had to check off on it from the local 
inspectors to the code to the to the you know safety inspectors to the people who actually had to work on it and he said that it might be five years of paperwork to do three years of construction and and he's trying to build an automation tool with with cliff for the canadian health center uh through the built environment that's about kind of like actually how could you i mean his competitor is a giant board of paper um it's so complicated and there are so many moments that are like, oh, look, it, the minute they showed it, all these threads came into this one decision. So that was a leverage point. And when you start looking at this as a complex system, you realize, oh, there are leverage points to be able to do something. And, and, I, and I think this continues that discussion. Um, Samia, I would love to have you come on up uh, and just talk about, you know, I think there's this tie and Deb fl flagged it a bit between the silver tsunami that Roger talked about. You know, eight to 10,000 people are becoming uh, 65 every day in America, and behavioral health. You know, what's what's your sort of take on this? What was your reaction maybe to the grand challenges or how do you see this relating to, um, you know, to the work that you've done and, and the projects that you've worked on? Yeah, I think, um, especially with this pandemic, what it's brought out is how important behavioral health is to each mm. individual and how it really does go across, you know, all age groups, everybody um, is affected by it and creating these environments that really help our behavioral health. Um, I think it's been something that's been largely ignored in society in general, just because of the large stigma that's placed on mental health, um, but removing that stigma and not just make, um, you know, keeping the behavioral health conversation to the facilities itself, but how that extends to all of our city um, and in the broader picture. So like, for instance, um, like city design and enabling people to go outside and how walkability, like how walkability is a huge factor and, you know, drawing people to the environment and how being cooped up inside our homes all day has a really negative effect and going to a city that is very walkable. Um, there's just an instant, wow, my city doesn't have that. And that's very important to have. Um, and one other thing that, you know, was kind of through my mind um, when we, when I was listening to the Grand Challenges discussion is something as specific as flexibility. Um, I think COVID's brought out a lot of shortcomings in our healthcare system, not only in our healthcare system, but, you know, in the broader sense of all our built environment and our cities themselves. So creating, um, innovate, like, innovatively creating flexible environments in every facility is really important and probably one of the biggest things that we're going to have to focus on um, in you know upcoming projects and something that we're having to focus on on some of the facilities that I'm designing currently. Hmm. This is the theme is the that theme. we've had kind of repeatedly. Um, when we've done shows on urban design, we've talked about the increasing importance of flexible zoning. Like if you look at San Francisco now, where a lot of the officer buildings are being hollowed out and abandoned, you want to be able to adapt in real time and adapt it to housing or to arts or or, or, or to whatever. The last week's show, which was about using flexibility to, to, to design an environment for, uh, for economic development. And I guess when you get into a world where you can measure and see feedback loops and systems, it drives you nuts to realize it's going to take 75 years to, to change a building and you want to make it programmable because everything becomes an experiment and a possibility for improvement. Yeah. And how do, oh, sorry. Go. <laughs> Plus siloed communities aren't the answer, right? A, a neighborhood that's only about one thing. Yeah. If it's only business, it, it closes up at night. But if we create our environments in our communities where there are so many different things happening in, in that community, there's a vibrancy that is, is intergenerational that is healthy healthy for the community, as well as the people who live there. Yup. You know, the, 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 yeah. the, Mickey, this, this systems theme keeps running through so, so much of what, of, what, of what we're doing. And this, this just seems like a, a classic thing where you get, you get kind of all of this data. And then the question is, how do you, how are you making systems, how, how are you making decisions to make things work out 
for the best for everybody. How much, um, Deborah, in the work that you're doing, how much of this you know, then requires a fair amount of um, systems thinking, computer science, AI to start looking at all the factors that come in and help people understand what decisions really lead to the best output and such? We've been seeing a lot of changes in our industry and best practices over the years. I think that we're not there yet, but you're seeing a lot of that being introduced. You're seeing a lot of um, computer-aided design that runs through mm -hmm. you know, hundreds or thousands of design solutions quickly mm -hmm. to help get to the final one. But I think there's still a lot of um, individualized thinking that goes into the design and built environments, right? We have not shifted as a community as quickly as others might have. Though, you know, BIM and, and, you know, AutoCAD, all those have made a significant difference. A lot of it is still the individual brain and its ability to creatively solve problems. And, you know, in spite of the fact that we are bringing in bigger and bigger teams, there's still people who are missing from the conversation, right? You, should, you, you I, need to talk to the janitorial services to understand what their issues are to make sure that you're designing and building for them as well. But that's not always what happens, right? In spite of you trying to bring in as many voices, there's still people missing from the table. You know, so Raz Kama mentioned that there are typically 35 consulting firms to build a hospital. Um, you know, there are a lot of intersecting pieces and parts. You mentioned CAM and BIM. And for people that are watching this that don't know what those words are, or CAD and BIM, uh, CAD is computer-aided design. But I would say that, you know, when I was there as a fellow, um, the chief technology officer said it's mostly computer-aided drafting. It's not actually helping you think about these things. And BIM, building information models, had a promise of what was possible, but but it's turned out to be kind of an almost unfunded mandate uh, for architects or for other people that where it's just more work, but it doesn't actually help. Um, I thought it might be fun. I'm gonna show if I can do a share screen um, and we'll see if this works. I'll show a little, yeah, there we go. I'll show a little example. Now, how do I do this? I guess I have to go to, PowerPoint. I want to show you what happens when you actually start enlisting machine learners in a sort of digital twin or digital stunt double world and say, look, here are some goals that I have as a facility manager. They're different goals than maybe you have as a worker. They're different goals than I, you, know, you have as a nurse, et cetera. So here's an example of an experiment we did in, um, uh, in, in Toronto at the Mars space. And let me just go ahead and play it. Uh, and And you can see here's the space in Toronto. We censored up for three years. Um, Omid, is that playing a video? Yep, it's playing. Perfect. We censored up and, and tracked uh, meeting spaces, adjacency, work style, buzz, productivity. These are hard for a human to keep in their head at once. Two goals were really tricky, adjacency and work style, because those are like human goals. How do you know you want to be close to somebody? And then, of course, we had hard obstacles, plans and boundaries and things. And then we spawned a bunch of architectural interns in the cloud. And we said, look, here are our objectives on the right. Here are the inputs. We had all the sensors from the LEED certification going. We tracked Microsoft calendar invites. We looked at where people actually went and we did sort of fluid dynamics on this to look at work style preferences and minimizing uh, uh, acoustic and noise so you could actually do there. We set up some of these little virtual agents with with microphones and headsets so they could wander around and listen for virtual buzz and do sort of a discovery of, oh, that's what happens if you put the coffee center over there. And that's how buzz increases or decreases. We also put little virtual cameras on them and they wandered around looking for beautiful views to the outside because we actually know daylight and productivity make a difference. We knew where Toronto was so we could cast the sun. We could start to say, how do we put more people out by the sun and so they can see it? How do they see views to the outside? So this was this notion of could I enlist thousands, tens of thousands of AI agents with only one little detail to, to pay attention to, and how would that help the architect understand it? And unfortunately, you know, when you have thousands of cho choices, it's really hard for an architect. We have bounded rationality. And so what we did was we said, okay, what if we could look at just pairwise combinations? You know, what if we could look at all these combinations and explore them like, like asking a bunch of interns to do this, productivity versus something or daylight versus you know floor space or buzz versus adjacency preferences. And you could pick those and the architect had a very different discussion because they could look at multi-dimensions and they could actually talk to the customer. And the customer was able to say, oh, that's what happens if we optimize for this or this. 
And so it really was helping how humans think. And I think that that became a big difference. Nowadays, this is becoming much more positive in terms of what they call generative design. You just say, I want seven bedrooms. Generate how many ways I could lay this out. I want two bedrooms. Generate how many ways I could lay this out. So the system is doing the grunt work. This is a group called TestFit. They might say, okay, I'm building a hospital uh, condominium or I'm in a, a campus. And as you sit there and start dragging things around, you start to actually see how many rooms you could fit. You could define those things. It could maybe, again, tell you how is this going to actually affect the city plan. You could understand what's going on. So there's a lot of progress going on here. What we don't have, though, is they don't consume the research from the center. They don't dynamically go, this is what we've learned as a baseline. And there are no sliders for mental health. There are no sliders for, you know, for, for those intangibles that have to do with, with how you might want to lay things out. Um, I will point out that now that the IoT is getting more involved, we're starting to see new tools to be able to see how light works and how these sensors are working and how we're actually you know, either bombarding people with too much fluorescence or not enough, how the CO2 levels are working. And the newest research is around uh, space during COVID so that you can actually reopen offices and do things. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, people are starting to use game platforms. This is Tencent and Penrose in China to actually look at hospital fill rates during the pandemic. And they're able to basically use a game platform like Epic or Unity and they're able to basically slice across and see how many beds are available, see what's going on. This is all live data from real things, but now it's almost becoming more playful. You can actually explore it and you can actually start to ask questions about it. So I just wanted to give a sense that on the good front or the good news front, uh, things are happening. You know, there's, there's, there's some progress here. What's missing though is a lot of the things maybe Sammy and Deb just talked about. There's so many human connections here. There's so much stuff that I don't know how I would spawn an agent because AI doesn't have common sense. It doesn't think the way a human does, you know, to get to the mental or physical or other kinds of things. Um, but it's promising. Uh, we're starting to start look at where we can enlist machine learning to handle complexity. Hey, can I ask a question about gaming here? Because it's really fascinating to see. Of course, these gaming engines are incredibly sophisticated. And they're a great way to educate because all sorts of kids are playing them and they kind of get the innate system mm. set of things. Um, has anyone done a video game where, you know, the objective is to keep people alive or be healthy and the stuff you get to mess with <laughs> are these environmental factors and stuff? Because that would be a really cool way to diffuse this and learn. And plus, mm. you have all those fascinating, tantalizing real-time data sets that you're showing, like uh, Epic picking up the, the, the hospital data. Hmm. Is that is that like a, I don't I bet nobody's built that although you know um, like is Epic has these grants that they give to um, they have they give grants to people who use their platform to do interesting things and it just strikes me that would be a very cool project because there's such knowledge with what uh, Deborah's doing and there's such data and they're already using the platform and we could turn around right and that becomes something that people could learn and play with like I would love to play with something and figure out what what affects the change. I think I'll answer your question, but I'd love to find out from Deb or Sammy if you know anything uh, along this dimension. You know, there was actually a Wired article about this a while back. It was about League of Legends, which is a big multiplayer game. And Riot decided to do a set of experiments called the Optimus Experiments. They had 217 unique conditions across 10 million games worth of play, right? And they were able to, like, have, because, you know, Unity and, and Epic together have billions of people using these, whether they're casual games or whatever. And they were able to start detecting how to reduce abusive language inside of games. They were able to start playing with like slight lever combinations to not kick people out completely, but actually to, to sort of nudge people towards better norms. Because in a game, you can kind of shape the norms. You're, you're the god of the game controller. So, so there is some progress going on here. Um, and not that long ago, I think it was MIT, did a study where they actually were curious about high-performing teams. So think about a team, uh, Atul Gawande in, in the healthcare space has written quite a lot about how do, we, how do we build better checklists? How do we figure out how teams work together inside of a hospital to all team up and help people uh, you know, get healthy? And, um, and so there was an effort inside of a video game as well around collective intelligence. So they tested it in a game, but they were able to actually demonstrate that it, it carried over into real life. 
So I, you know, I've seen a few little samples of this, um, but I don't know Deb or or Samia. I don't know if you've seen anything inspiring or or provocative that's just a, an early signal in this space of kind of using games with physics and things. I, I have not seen a, you know, look, my my uh, gaming stopped at Miss Pac-Man, right? So <laughs> right. But what I will say is I have seen through going to CES and um, mm. many, many of the places that I end up, I've seen a lot of apps and games that have been built to nudge behavior, right? To change. Mm. So I think it's a, it's a small leap to go from there to Peter, what you were asking. And I, the one thing I will say is that I speak to students a lot. I go to a lot of schools and mm. never walk out of there without being completely amazed by the intelligence and the progressiveness of this next generation that's graduating into our industry. And I have no doubt that they grew up with that and they are thinking along those lines, right? That they are playing with and creating and it's probably more about a matter of time. I do. Um... I do want to note, uh, you know, and Roz said it as well, this notion of discover how architecture nudges behavior. Uh, Herb Zyman, the Nobel winning uh, economist who developed the theory of satisficing, that humans are not perfect economic players, that we sacrifice and we satisfy. It means we can't, we have bounded rationality. We just can't cope with all the options. And because of that, the space nudges our behavior more than we think. And in fact, uh, Dr. Ting Jiang, who's been on the show from Danny Ariely's lab and others, have pointed out that upwards of 70% of our decisions every day are made by things outside of our brain. You know, there's a checkbox that says donate an organ or the unchecked box that says don't de donate an organ. Massive dis differences in countries that, that have a checkbox one way or a checkbox another. 70% in one country like the Netherlands, 20% in the country right next door to Belgium. The only difference is the checkbox on the DMV. It's not a decision you make, it's a zombie decision. And so there's a lot that happens through architecture that shapes up to 70% of our decisions. So our things and our places are not just things and places. They actually have an opinion and, and, and they're built by somebody, whether they knowingly knew, you know, making it so you had to opt out would lower donor rates or making it that it was already opted in would allow something called the default bias. A lot of architects don't seem to even know about this stuff. And yet, you know, Herb Simon published the paper and it won a Nobel Prize, you know, decades ago on the idea that our mind is like a pair of scissors. One blade is the brain running the rules, the ant looking for sugar. The other blade is the environment it pushes against. And the emergence, ant hills being 70 degrees, farming fungus, fighting wars, happens in the intersection. Cities are the emergence of those things. So I, I, I was trying to think of what we could learn from science and how do we factor that in. And, and it reminded me that Sudeshna over here, uh, Mah Mahata said, I'm curious about the intersection between designing spaces and systems and services that drive health and inclusive design, especially when they're contradictory. And I do think this is a problem. We have bounded rationality. And that's that notion of could we slide sliders on, on high dimensions and enlist help? I don't know the answer. I don't know if anybody knows the answer to, to how to deal with this, but part of it is, you know, the design process itself is about inviting need knowers into the space, inviting stakeholders to be a part of the conversation, not just to be beaten over the head with it once it happens. You know, I'm, I'm going to a hotel where they're just gonna shove me into some room that I didn't know they had another set of infections, which is the way a hospital feels. So, so I do think there's, there are hints, tantalizing hints, um, but we almost need to enlist help uh, from all these different disciplines. Maybe that's the, the crux of this. Um, Roz pointed out Richard Thaler, and of course there's a lot of behavioral economists out there um, that have been exploring the economic impact of how we make decisions. But it's a, it's a big space. How do we get those built in to the tools we use so that, so that the best basic practices can be picked up and then we can extend them? Um, I, I was thinking we're coming up on uh, five o'clock Pacific time. Uh, I, I want to give a chance to uh, Sammy and Deb, if you if you need to bail because it's a Friday night, please bail. Um, and, and we just love that, that you were able to come. We do have another clip. It's probably seven minutes from from our panel. And it's actually how they would riff on each other. It's how they would play together. Um, and uh, and I thought we could play that after the after the five o'clock hour. Um, but I first wanted to say any last words, Deb or Samia, and please stay if you can, and we can kind of riff on what we see uh, in the next little segment. 
Samia, anything you want to share? Sorry, my mic was muted. Um, yeah, back to the question about um, just the intersection between designing spaces and making them inclusive. That was a large um, part of my the award-winning project, um, mm. NOLA Behavioral Health Inpatient Facility. Since we were dealing with um, New Orleans, that still had a lot of lingering effects from Hurricane Katrina, both in the financial sense and uh. mental sense. Um, and yeah, there is no easy answer on how to design um, to promote inclusivity, but especially in the healthcare system where there is a very, it's can be a largely inaccessible market for a lot of people. Um, for us, since it is a hypothetical project, um, not really knowing how, if it would actually mm. work, but with really designing programmatically what elements are needed for the community and not just kind of putting your own idea on what is needed for that area. So in New Orleans specifically, we were dealing with a very high poverty rate and a high homeless population. Mm. So for us, it was looking, um, doing a lot of research into different, you know, facilities that have helped um, that community and draw, uh, I previously had volunteered at this area that was kind of like a ro homeless rehabilitation that had, you know, um, a beauty salon, something as simple as boosting the self-esteem in that way, just looking good and feeling good. A computer lab for not necessarily job searching, but just, you know, reading the news or getting in contact with mm. family or loved ones um, and social workers offices. So we included a lot of those functions in our building and just having a clean bathroom for um, that population to use to take a shower or, you know, go in that way. Um, so I think with inclusivity, it takes a lot of thinking and just mm. thinking out of the box and not putting your own idea on what that population needs, but really doing work and doing a lot of research into, you know, just simple ways that you can draw people to your facility um, mm. and make it an area that can help the community and really better the community. So, Samia, this was um, this was your award-winning project, and we're we're putting the little tag down below, and we're sending it off to everybody in the different streams. But um, I'm curious between Sa Samia and Deb. Deb, why was this picked as a winner? Why? What were the things that your judges saw in what Samia was doing? And could you both have a conversation about that? I'd love to see that. Sure. I, so this architecture and design at its best is solving modern social problems, right? I mean, how can mm -hmm. it be part of the solution? And in Samia's project, that's what she did, right? She really looked at the modern social problem of disenfranchised mm -hmm. people and homeless people and people with mental and health issues. And um, from a multi-generational and a multi-pronged approach, came up with solutions, right? at every level of all the people in a community who might have need of mental and mental health assistance. And from beds to stay overnight to um, places for homeless people. So I think that was the draw. It was so well thought out um, from a modern social problem standpoint and how architecture could really be a part of solving and trying to solve those problems. Uh, Sammy, I'm curious, You know, were you surprised that you won, that your team won or your project won? Yeah, my partner, yeah, it was a partner project. We were mm -hmm. very happy and of course surprised, um, but we did put a lot of work in and our professor um, helped out a lot. So yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a great honor. I mean, it's what I said That's earlier, excellent. Peter, that th this next generation of, of designers that are coming out of school are just awesome. <laughs> they just are so thoughtful and heartfelt and, um, yeah, I, I think that we have a lot of good things that are going to come down the pike in the next decade because mm -hmm. of uh, this different kind of thinking and um, sensitivity that they're bringing to the field. Yeah, there's an urgency to this. And I think, you know, I'm hoping to have an episode about, um, uh, uh, you know, this notion of the pluriverse, about how we actually need to invite people in that otherwise have been marginalized or have been uh, ignored or treated as a problem or thrown at the police in the hopes that maybe they'll cope with it. Um, but it's a really significant issue. And I, I'm, I'm very glad, Sammy, that you took this on. 
And it, it's just sensitizing as a designer too to probably just go to learn about that. I mean, it just opens your eyes. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, if we do a, a sort of pluriverse episode, I'd love to have you come back because I, I just think I think having this conversation about how do we actually open up the dimension from Aristotelian kind of you know great man theory the, thinking theorizing to more you know Taoist and and alternative views about kind of how we might uh, how we might uh, open up and enable these things and and flatten out those power dynamics because it feels like that's that's one of the biggest challenges in this. Um, are you all feeling like staying and we want to watch the last little episode of, of how everyone will play together? All right. Uh, Omid, can we run? It. Yeah, let's watch it. I have a personal interest in this and have been on the board of advisors for a while now. I'm particularly interested because I study cognition and so much of our cognition isn't inside our brain. It's actually us and the other. It's me and my family. It's me and my place. That's where thinking shows up. That's how we actually do it. And so context is decisive. And that's the focus I've had is how do we, if we can't change me, how do I change me by changing the environment or by changing the way I interact with others? Um, because we will create something new, a new mind between us. And, and so that means things matter and places matter. And as a product designer and as someone who's designed spaces, I've been very passionate about learning how the things I make actually impact people and how they might help us grow. The world is like optimized, uh, is, is designed for local optimization. Everyone, mm -hmm. really smart people, generally tend to look at things that they can control and that they can affect and will try to find a way to solve problems that are local to them. Mm -hmm. And so it, the world is really not designed for system design, right? Like you, like no. you cannot, think holistically and systematically because all the models that the world knows and people know how to operate generally tend to optimize for like more local focus. And therefore we look at like governments and other things to try to create a more system uh, wide view. And, th and this has been a big thing on the back of my mind, right? Like how do you bring people together that can by dint of the responsibilities and focuses that they have, have that ability to locally optimize, but actually understand that they can do better if they can actually work together and go after the system. And it's so tricky because we don't have a system sense. I can't touch something and go, this is linear and it's straightforward, or this goes into some crazy chaotic space right here and it's gonna have this ripple effect that's gonna really hurt. How could we build a system sense? How could we help us? And I think it goes back to that collective action thing. What are some of the principles we could learn from maybe 3 billion years of R&D that happened with life yeah. that we could actually start to appreciate? We just launched a, a new federally qualified health center in McKinney, Texas. And one of the early experiences that I had there when we were kind of figuring out what, this, what the new clinic needed to be and, and engaging people at the old clinic was having a series of conversations with, with patients and clinicians. And one of the sessions that we sat in on, we realized very quickly that when you're trying to improve something like your diet as a diabetic, getting talked at and getting handed a piece of paper telling you what you should eat for a, in a 10 minute interaction isn't going to inspire you to change anything, isn't going to really help you get there either. And so thinking about how do we embed kitchens where um, somebody can teach you how to cook, give you a better bag of groceries to go home with. It's really intriguing with, to me. So I think I'd love to kind of understand from Thomas's uh, research and the work you're doing, what are some of those some of those opportunities? To what degree are they intertwined with space or not? Or how can space be a complement? Thomas, you mentioned design, data, and words. Why is it maybe more important than ever? as we move into 2021 and 2022, this intersection of design, data, and words. Sure, it's all information. It's all how we process information. And, and one of the things that I learned at my more than a decade at Wired was it's, you, you can write a great story, but that story is much more compelling if you put it in the environment of a really good, compelling design. So it's the combination in the printed page is actually a great technology, but when it's combined with visualizations, whether those are information, communicated information like an infographic or 
just a the structure of a piece of information, the structure of an article, the structure of a website, that that can be incredibly important in terms of actually getting people to comprehend or keep reading or care. Amy, what about you? We've been building research facilities in West Africa for analyzing DNA sequencing and doing lab testing for Ebola and other pandemics. And I think like thinking about how we can, what are the opportunities to first understand where those research opportunities exist, but then where the infrastructure is missing that would allow that to not only adjust quickly in in emerging global situations like what we're in right now, but also set the groundwork for preventing such things in the future. One of the fascinating things when you sit at this cutting edge where you're surrounded by super smart people who are inventing new things, you also start discovering that there is actually a lot that already exists that nature has already designed and invented. Mm. Can you actually have a sensor network that's harnessing nature? How to use the uh, mosquitoes as a, or insects for that matter as a sensing tool? How do you track what they eat? You can use pretty sophisticated genomic processing to take mm. a mosquito and the biomatter within that mosquito and create a map of everything that's in it. And a lot of times you will find all sorts of really surprising things that the mosquito has ingested. Hmm. And and it can give you early warning indicators for new kinds of viruses that might be propagating. Almost all of surveillance, disease surveillance type of stuff is done retroactively right now. A malaria epidemic goes through or a Zika epidemic goes through. And then you go and collect a lot of data about what happened. But part of the question that our scientists ask themselves is, how can you make this real time? You know, what I, what I love about that, you know, Vikram was just saying, mosquitoes, they're almost naturally little baby syringes. And they're going around and they're sampling whether you like it or not, they're biting you. And um, and so Microsoft has a video, and I'd have to go find it. But uh, in, from Vikram's team, it's actually like a little um, like a mosquito catcher or house. Uh, and when the mosquitoes go out, they go and do all the sampling they're going to do. But when they come back, this is kind of maybe it's sugary or something. They come back, and then they're able to analyze within this little mosquito catcher what the mosquito ate, what blood, what what conditions and the whole notion there of like nature's already doing this if we could just listen in uh, and if we could just pay attention uh, we might be able to instead of being uh, retroactive oh it's too late you know that Ebola has broken out how might we have a radar network how might we detect ahead of time that you know that the new enemy the new, new virus is coming um, there's actually some wonderful work today from biologists looking at the blooms of plankton using satellites. And they know that blooms of plankton for satellites are associated with cholera outbreaks. And in, um, in, in various parts of the, of the world, those, you can actually see where a cholera update, uh, uh, breakout will happen um, if, you, if you actually look at satellite data. So there's an opportunity here to think about how do we how do we actually enlist nature to help us? I guess we're back. Yeah, that, that brings to mind how they're using wastewater to find COVID outbreaks in communities in advance, right? And and that's um, the same thing, right? It's something that we would normally not pay attention to, but it, it's a, if you pay attention, it's an early warning to understand where um, we might need to look closer where we might need to pay more attention. Okay, it is 5.13 Pacific time. Any last words, any thoughts, uh, just reflections on what uh, the folks said, uh, Thomas or, or, or uh, Richard or anybody? <clears throat> I mean, for me, the last word is just how important it is to have these conversations with different mm -hmm. disciplines that you never know where there's going to be a synapse of an idea that you might get from somebody in a completely different field that you would never have access to 
who brings something to a conversation that helps you with a problem you're trying to solve today. And I think the more we can have these kinds of interdisciplinary conversations, the better off. I mean, not only are they interesting, right? For people who like intellectual acrobats, they're just fun and interesting, but the better off we're all going to be in our industries, in our jobs, and in the problems that we're trying to solve. You have highlighted kind of what we have realized is the essential theme of this show, which is we're in a systems-oriented, interdisciplinary world you can measure and feed back, and the understanding of that becomes you know, kind of core for a population and for governance. And we saw a crisis around that this year with the pandemic, where there was some allergic reaction to the to the scientific method. Um, and it's also interesting, you know, we want to name the show Endless Frontier after Vannevar Bush's work in 1945. But you also point out that the other thing that Vannevar Bush did in July of 1945 was right, as we may think, which is what ultimately led to the web, this notion that there were so many disciplines that went deep and if you lost the connectivity between them, you lost the possibility for innovation and for people in one discipline to see an insight uh, from something else. And, uh, you know, Mick, your point that the wonder lies at the, in at the intersection at the edges mm -hmm. is what we keep learning in, in, in this exploration. Well, and I think we have to learn it fairly quickly. Um, you know, that, that example that I just gave you of the cholera bloom, uh, cho cholera impact in, uh, in various places like Yemen particularly is having a very difficult time. Having the satellite network actually look at blooms of plankton is giving them a four, a four week predictive model. And we've got the article up here if you'd like to know more about it from the NIH, but a four weeks to be able to predict there's going to be a cholera outbreak in four weeks because of the bloom. But the more nuanced part of this is climate change is actually increasing uh, the infectious disease load on the planet dramatically. Uh, those blooms wouldn't be happening if it weren't that we are pumping a lot more carbon into the atmosphere. And so climate change, the shockiness of climate change that we're starting to see, which is the vacillation. Uh, and of course, you know, many people have loved ones in Texas and, and across the Midwest that are facing this right now. It's not going away, but it's also unlocking uh, uh, parasites, organisms, and things like that that we've never had before. And it's increasing, it's increasingly that this is going to be a biological century. And, and I think we're, we're starting to grapple with that, but obviously it has big economic impacts and health and, and uh, just livelihood impacts. It, it affects whether we'll survive and whether we can make money and all the rest. So we almost have to deal with this right now. I mean, I think, Deborah, to your point, this is a conversation that has to happen. And I think it's you don't know where somebody will be inspired by some moment, but it's also an urgent conversation. We don't, we, we this could be an epoch of change in a positive way. Uh, you know, Vannevar Bush's, uh, you know, Endless Frontier, or it could be an apocalypse. You know, so it's epoch versus apocalypse. And I think that's the challenge here because they're both happening and we've got a race against time. And we've got to we've got to kind of get our head around this and and getting conversations and thinking more in a system way helps. Uh, but it, we need everybody, every brain on deck. We need everybody you know, to, to get involved and feel a sense of agency. I think the harder part. And all this is when you hear these things and you see the Hollywood movies about the end of the earth, this and that, all the apocalyptic movies, you don't see a lot of, you know, it's a new epoch that we could actually harness nature, co-create with nature, learn about human nature, learn about these things, that this is actually a huge opportunity. It just doesn't sell Hollywood tickets. You know, it doesn't, it's, it's not if it bleeds, it leads, it's not news. So, so that's the thing I think we have to rally people around. And I think the work, Samia, you're doing to just pay attention to the you know people and the real challenges here on the mental health front. And Deb, your whole initiative and everyone who's been involved, just raising awareness and then also giving people tools to take action. The agency part is the hard part, because if, if I'm overwhelmed by it, I feel a sense of um, uh, self-doubt, and then I lose my sense of agency. And, and I think self-doubt is a bigger enemy than all of these things we're talking about in nature, if we don't feel we can do something. So thank you, Deb, for this amazing movement building.
because that's awesome. what it is. And it, and it helps us like preach to the choir, but you gotta get, you gotta get good at it. Pra choir practice is a good thing. Like you know, we gotta learn how to sing together and have very different voices. So thank you for, thank you for joining us and bringing Samia and, and, and Vikram and Roger and Amy and, and Thomas and everybody together. Um, and, uh, and Samia, thank you so much for joining as well. Thank you for inviting us to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Peter, any last, last words? Um, we may want to tee up next week's show, mm. uh, which is mm -hmm. all about how people can affect things through code and play. Uh, we're going to be speaking with our friend uh, Golden Levin, who was kind of one of the pioneers of, um, of computer art. And it, it's also a great time to talk about code as a creative medium, because in the last few weeks, um, crypto art, uh, kind of creative code that's monetizable, has started to take off as we've seen hmm. this craziness in Bitcoin and then in Dogecoin. Um, so th th this whole space, which has been both about creative exploration and the role of code as an artistic arena, I think it's about to go through its own new epoch. So it is timely. Agreed. And and this is the book. It just came out. Um, and it's by Golden Levin and Tiga Brain. And they'll bo they're both going to be here. But what's wonderful is Golden is sort I of... i order that book before next week. You better get it. Um, yeah. But there are some really right tangible examples of how to learn how to code as a creative medium. Beautiful things. We're also going to have uh, Natrice Baskin on, who is just a wonder child about developing ways of having young girls and and women see themselves in building circuit boards using machine learning you know being able to tap into things so natrice will be here she's quoted in the book uh tiga will be here uh golan will be here and dan uh, uh dan butso will be here who is a wonderful artist in the uk so we've got we've got a lot of things going on next friday will be a wonderful uh, dive into arts. And, and I think the arts often presuppose, they give us a little hint because it's individuals and small collectives kind of reacting to the world. And they sometimes almost don't know any better. So they do things that people look at and go, that's not possible. Uh, what'd you do? And they bend and break and, and kind of become virtuosos at helping us see where the future goes. So it's really good to think about uh, a good friend of mine who we're going to have on the show soon, I said, well, you know, science is at one side, it's the compressible, it's e equals mc squared, three letters, or, you know, not a number, um, but it compresses down this thing that gave us the atomic era. And on the other spe side of the spectrum is art, it's the uncompressible, it's, it's the ineffable, it's, it's, you know, the novel, Middlemarch, where you're getting inside of what you think about someone else who thinks about someone else who thinks about you, you know, the layered complexity of things that you don't want a cliff note for. But my friend Massimo said, uh, when I said that to him, it's like the spectrum. He said, it's not a spectrum. It actually bends back around on itself. Um, art and science you know, start in different places, but they actually come back and inspire each other. And I think that's, I'm hoping that's part of the conversation that we're gonna have next week. Art is, um, it's an interestingly positioned word because most people figure it's just art, which precludes the possibility that it's a societal early warning indicator a boundary breaker, a mechanism to kind of explore with play and create and uh, and hugely complementary to, seri to serious work because yeah. art has fewer of those constraints. So we're going to get into that next week. Well, and I, I think it's serious too. You know, I mean, I would say this though, um, you know, I, were, I was um, on the board of um, WQED in Pittsburgh. We've had some people from Pittsburgh in and, you know, that's where uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood came from. And uh, Fred Rogers, who's I think one of my guiding saints, uh, and we should have him on the show at some point. We we haven't had a dead guest in a while, but Fred Rogers, you know, said ultimately, play is the work of childhood, and I think art is often about play, and it's serious. It's the serious work of childhood. <laughs> it's the way we learn about things. It's the way we poke and prod in a safe environment to be able to do something. And so, yeah, I. I don't think it's less serious. I think it's just different. And I think the safety to say it's play. Like experiments are about having hypothesis and trying it. And that's a child is the master experimenter. They flip the spoon and they, they plaster you with the, uh, the applesauce. And they're like, oh, look, 
Dad got mad. Oh, let me try that again. You know, they're learning. And and uh, maybe that's the whole you know, adventure we're, we're on. Really serious, we're though, if we were really serious, though, if we were really serious, we would not malign the possibility of not being serious, right? We somehow have to stick everything back in the serious bucket as if <laughs> not right. being serious. I take umbrage with that, Peter. I'm just trying to use new words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, this is a serious effort at being unserious. That's correct. Uh, you're, and, you're right. You're right. Actually, it's it's good to not not actually feel that pressure of uh, everything is serious. We need these refractory periods. Um, and Sudeshna, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, Sudeshna uh, noted that she's just enjoyed the conversation, but I also think her other comment was great. Speculative design. You know, how do we do sort of science friction futures? How do we how do we put friction into the future and come back and say, how about this? This is a better approach. And you know, I was raised on Star Trek, and that was a, you know, that was that and the Muppets. I think is how I learned how everything works in the world. Um, but the, you know, that was a very speculative and and glorious future because it was kind of to go where where no one has gone before to explore, and it was it was groundbreaking in its time. I think we need to um, inspire the next generation of speculative design as well. Uh, okay, I think I think we're ready to wrap. What time is it, Peter? Mickey, it is now 5.25 p.m. in our ever-accelerating endless frontier of quarantine. Next time, we will experiment with and explore epic or apocalypse, affluence versus effluence, all of these <laughs> in, in, our, in our frontier where time is speeding up and quarantine evolves. <laughs> Until next Friday, we'll see you in the ether. Let's get close, but not so close.